Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. And eventually I was like, you know what? It's so much importance on being able to have good relationships with people you work with, being able to be understood, being brought in at the right time, being someone that isn't invited just because you're in finance, but actually because you're in the room to add value and people see that in you. And I think finance can have that back office feel to it when it shouldn't. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Strength in the Numbers show. Today I'm talking with Susan Lee Creedon and Susan's start to her accounting and finance career was a little unusual in that she wanted to become a sports coach. However, missed accounting so much that she took a commerce degree and then started training with Deloitte. But following that, I'm working for a period of time in Australia. Uh, Susan then was shown and learned actually there was a bit more to life than simply work. So on returning to Ireland and working in a hotel, uh, Susan realised she wanted to travel more and then found a way into the not-for-profit sector and various finance leadership roles in there and ended up working in over 20 countries uh, by my count, mostly in Africa, Middle East and Southeast Asia. And on today's show, one of the things that I'm most interested in talking to Susan about is her latest work as an image consultant. Yes, (laughs) that's right before we dismiss it. Image consults a big, and it's something I encourage you to listen and learn from because I also believe we have an image challenge in finance and accounting that's preventing us from maybe being as influential and as impactful as we can be and holding us back from having the rewarding careers and fun careers that we should be having in our profession. And also on the podcast, we talk about other areas of conflict within business. Uh, particularly where non-finance people are afraid of numbers, some tips on how finance and accounting professionals can move from the back seat to the front row, and also touching on an article Susan wrote around how to combat imposter syndrome, and she shares her story around there. It was really great fun uh, chatting with Susan, and if you enjoy the show, please don't forget to recommend it to your friends and colleagues. We're on all the major platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify, and we really appreciate you investing your time with us today. So without further ado... Over to Susan and the show. So Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. And it's it's great to be here. Yeah, no, it's delighted to have you on, fellow Irish person as well. I know you're over in the UK, but some of our audience may not be as familiar with your journey in, in finance. So would you mind perhaps sharing a bit of that with us, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I had a kind of a funny start, I think, because when I was leaving school, I really wanted to be a PE teacher. I wanted to be a sports coach. Like at the time in Ireland, there was only one college that did it and they took 20 people a year and I didn't get a space. I took a year out and the only thing I missed that year was accountancy. So I didn't even like apply for the the home and the PE again. And I went and uh, studied commerce in in Galway in UCG. I was lucky enough to get a placement with Deloitte um, during my time in college and went down the auditor route. And I stayed with Deloitte in Dublin for three and a half years, went off to Australia like most people did in 2000, like all accountants were over there working spent some time over there. And I think the biggest lesson I had from living in Australia was that there was more to life than work. Mm. And um, because the Australians just had, they worked hard, but they left work behind them and really enjoyed their weekends, very outdoorsy and all of that. So when I came back to Ireland, I, I started working with, just took a contract with a hotel group and realized it just wasn't for me. I wanted to travel again and see more of the world. And I thought the best way to do this is to live somewhere else because you really get to see and understand. So I volunteered with Goal, which is an Irish NGO, International Development and and Emergency, and found myself as financial controller of Goal in Uganda. I spent two years there. It was incredible. When I joined, we had, I think, about 30 staff and a budget of about 700,000. And when I left two years later, we had a budget of over 4 million and over 100 staff. 
Oh, and congratulations. Yeah, it was fantastic. And being part of that and being right in the middle of it, just really great learning. Mm-hmm. And I kind of and I got a bit of a name for myself, got promoted to being you know, more of a roving person and spent kind of year, two years going to other country offices, helping them to, I suppose, involve finance perhaps as well in the business better mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not be in the back room, actually at the table, because that was one of the most frustrating things for me at the beginning was, you know, well, finance just does processes everything for us. And I'm like, uh, no, that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. How can I do a budget if I don't know what the business is dealing with? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How can I report on what you want if I don't know what that is? And, you know, and that's how we and also if you're going to grow, you need me to help you grow because I'll do the scenario planning and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And then from there, I traveled for like two years and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, with work. But it it was just hard. So it was like, okay, I need to I need to put my feet down. And actually, I remember saying I need to buy cutlery. (laughs) I couldn't think of anything more mundane in life than actually owning cutlery. (laughs) What what, what, what possessed you to to buy want to buy cutlery? just felt because my life was out of a suitcase and it was very like Uh, I was going from place to place all the time and I had nothing kind of standard in my you know everybody else I suppose was kind of getting married at the time and you know doing normal stuff and I was out in Pakistan after an earthquake or Sri Lanka after the tsunami Mm. and I thought like this is the most mundane thing I can think about is buying Mm. cutlery so that's Mm. what I want to be doing (laughs) I want to live normal (laughs) So how do you, how do you, how do you transition back to normal after what seems like quite an amazing amazing experience of going country to country helping businesses with their decisions and so on and well you find a job as a finance director at the age of 33 <laughs> <laughs> for an international organization again ah. an NGO <laughs> that has 116 overdue donor reports oh wow I mean, when I look back, I was I was naive taking on a role like that, but it was incredible because it it really needed to be turned around. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a huge change management piece transformation, but also it was the making of me, I think, because going from an organization that absolutely had no interest in finance, but was an organization that cleared landmines around the world and was so successful at what it did, clearing land for, you know, schools to be built on, houses, whatever, that the donors were really supportive of the fact that the finances were behind and gave them time to turn it around. But mm. time like that is limited. Yeah. And and so I had a massive job and, you know, the auditors were in there for kind of eight months of the year doing accounts prep as well as the audit, which, of course, I wouldn't agree with, you know, but mm. I had to turn all of that around and there was one other qualified finance person. Now, our budget was like 23 million pounds. So it wasn't, you know, a small organization. And it took quite a while, obviously, to turn it around. But not only had you to, had I to turn it around, it's also I had to make sure that we didn't go overdue with anything that was coming up. So it was kind of like, I suppose I had short term, medium term and long term. And long term is clearing the backlog, short term, making sure that the cash is accounted for because that was the biggest problem really was eventually we were going to run out of cash because if we weren't reporting we weren't getting paid exactly so i did that for three and a half years turned it all around and and grew as well i think it was about 45 million when i decided right that's it i've had it (laughs) and i was exhausted you know and even though i'd gotten people on board and made finance a partner in the business It had taken a lot out of me personally. So I went back to university because, you know, it's like, yeah, how do you kind of come back into normal life? And Mm. a part of me was like, my identity was all over the place. I want to study identity. So I went back to university and I studied political science, but I did nationalism and ethnic conflict. Because I wanted to understand coming from conflict zones, you know, I'd been in countries like I'd been in Kurdistan, I'd been in Cambodia, Laos, Sudan, countries where civil war and all sorts of different wars of independence had taken place. And and I really wanted to understand what made people fight 
for their country mm. and also just what is it in us kind of you know that inspires different identities or following people or whatever and, and, and it was a fascinating year learned loads and I suppose opened my eyes to the world in a different way felt well you know what now I need to do something other than finance this is me mm. now branching away but of course reality hits in when you need to look for a job again and I found myself back in finance and I took a short-term contract and the minute I walked in the door I knew I'd made a mistake Mm -hmm. And I laughed. Oh, actually, I took a permanent job, but I, I resigned just before my probation was up because, you know, I turned it around and it was too small for me and I needed more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I applied for a CFO job in Switzerland, didn't get it in an international organization, but they asked me to come and do some finance work anyway. Mm. And that was actually, I, I think the job I did there, I went in for three months. I left six years later. <laughs> We went in for three months and in three to six months in international development or in charity accounting, you have restricted reserves and unrestricted reserves. So the restricted reserves are the cash that's come with restrictions from a donor mm -hmm. and has to be spent maybe like on food in Sir. Cambodia or used for anything, you know, obviously within the purposes of the business. And this organization was about 10 years old and couldn't, had never separated these two restricted from unrestricted. So had no idea. And I went in and I actually kind of reversed engineered the whole thing back to day zero wow. by reconciling cash and bank the whole way back and split out exactly what the reserves were. And it was just this amazing piece of work. I was like so proud of it. I was in a red folder and I used to like carry it around with me. <laughs> but anyway, they saw something in me and asked me to move sideways and I did. So I moved into project management and from there became the director of country programs. So I was managing from an operational perspective, managing people overseas that were running the country offices, the country directors. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge step for me because, you know, I was a finance person who don't usually <laughs> aren't given the greatest kind of you yeah, know good yeah. with people. And here I am line managing 10 extremely well-versed, well-qualified, technical people. And I think that became a coaching relationship as a result, mm -hmm. because each of them, like all of us, had things that they wanted to do better or didn't believe in themselves or, you know, imposter syndrome, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And by working with them and listening to them and helping them believe in themselves and really shine and be there for their staff and all of that, it was an amazing three years, which brings me to today, more or less, because I left that job without a job to go to, like I have every every time. But I thought, you know what, now it's time to do something for myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I did a couple of courses. I did some coaching courses, but I wasn't really sure how to tie finance back in. And it was kind of always at the back of my mind. And eventually I was like, you know what, it's so much importance on being able to have good relationships with people you work with, being able to be understood, being brought in at the right time, being someone that isn't invited just because you're in finance, but actually because you're in the room to add value and people see that in you. And I think finance can have that back office feel to it when it shouldn't. I felt, well, you know what, maybe it needs a bit of a makeover mm. for some people. Yeah. And so I came up with, well, I'm going to be an image consultant for accountants. <laughs> because, you know, if you introduce yourself to somebody as like non-accountant people, if I say I'm coaching finance people, mm. I might as well stick forks in their eyes. They're just not interested yeah. in talking to me. But if I say I'm an image consultant for accountants, they'll say, oh, what does that mean? Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And I can go into the conversation and they'll go, oh, yeah, I can't ever talk to my finance person. I don't know what they're talking about or whatever. Everyone has a story. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do now, um, Andrew, is work with finance people who feel they could have a greater impact in the workplace by using their voice. I agree. And I think I think the, the voices we bring on this the show, like yourself, Susan, um, really sort of help those in finance become more influential, more impactful in their organizations. And I think when that happens, then as part of that process, it's finding that meaning, the, that enjoyment in the work. I mean, it sounds like just, just by your career, it just sounds absolutely amazing, the experiences you've had. And I'd, I'd love to just pick pick on a few of those, of those items as well. You mentioned conflict, right? Yeah. 
I mean, you've probably seen conflict in the various war zones or whatever. Like, what are the main areas of conflict in, in business and our organizations and finance people to be aware of in your mind? I often found you'll start arguing with somebody <laughs> because they don't understand their numbers. Mm -hmm. and they become their numbers you know they're living and breathing but often we'll speak one language and they'll speak Mm -hmm. a different one and we might be talking about the same thing Mm. but you can kind of get you know you kind of like get a bit ingrained in well don't you know what this accrual is or this payment (laughs) or whatever it might be and they take it for granted yeah Yeah. you take it for granted exactly you don't even think about it And I think that often causes the numbers are coming from finance, but they're my numbers. Mm -hmm. This is something I would hear over and over again. And it's like, well, actually, they are your numbers. You gave them to us in the first place. And now we're giving them back to you. How can we help you understand them better? Yeah. And then you sit down and you help people pick out what it is they're trying to understand. And often it's really simple. But it's a terminology thing. And I think people are afraid of numbers is one of the things I've always found. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, we definitely take that for granted, don't we? Yeah, and if you're afraid of something, you don't want to deal with it. Yeah. And you put it to one side. And I think this all started with my my dad was had his own business and he was really frightened of the tax man. <laughs> like all Irish people are. I think, they know? are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still to this day. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I set up a spreadsheet for him that would automatically calculate the VAT mm. when he was doing his invoicing or whatever it was. And then the same for expenditure, you know, depending on what type, what VAT rate and everything. And once he could see how easy it was, the numbers weren't that difficult for him, you know? So I kind of brought that with me when you deal with other people. And often, I suppose I found maybe maybe a more junior member of staff who still hasn't understood how to talk to somebody in normal language. Yeah. You know, they will become ingrained in a debate with someone and before long it escalates and then, you know, you, you get involved. So it's also about helping the finance team understand that there's a way to help people and a way not to. You know, when it comes to technical jargon, leave it out. Just yeah, leave it the, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think we sort of bit guilty of hiding behind our yeah. spreadsheets and using the NPVs, IRRs, and ROIs and all these complicated terms in our minds. And yeah, yeah, leave it out. Leave leave, leave it out. This use normal language. <laughs> use, but also, maybe we're afraid sometimes because we don't understand the business well enough. And that could yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. We see we, we see that coming across sometimes. You know, you know it's, we're hiding behind the numbers sometimes and not really understanding the business. Yeah. And actually, it's usually pretty simple what people want to know and, you know, and yeah. yeah. So I think don't let conflict escalate. And there's always a way. And often it's just to sit down and listen to somebody and listen to understand, not to respond. You know, even say nothing. Yeah, well, 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 well you know, you had some great uh, questions in there, though. You know, like, how can I report on, on what you want if, you, if, if we don't engage, if we don't? Yeah. engage in the conversation sit there and listen yeah but but there's always a way i think that's that's the thing there's always a way always a way even if there feels like there's conflict at the time so no so appreciate um appreciate you sharing that susan and yeah. um i think okay, maybe that sort of feeds in to something you were saying about an image makeover for finance <laughs> i'd never heard it put like that before <laughs> but <laughs> I, I obviously I think, different, Andrew. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think our audience are picking up on that, definitely. <laughs> so, but, uh, but so what does a makeover for finance sort of involve or look like or come across like? Okay, and I do think we believe that finance has changed, and it has. There's no doubt about it, mm. you know, that the image is different. It is not the Monty Python image. You know, I know some of the listeners won't understand that, but the kind of, you know, the guy or Scrooge or whoever sitting in an office you know, with grey hair, glasses, balding, not talking to anyone. I mean, that yeah. we're not like that anymore. But no. there's still a, a, maybe a personality type that's more prone to going into finance than other careers. Definitely historically. I mean, it was a great yeah. way. If, if so you wanted to get people not to talk to you at yeah. a, a dinner or a barbecue, just tell them you're an accountant. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> and still, people don't really want to talk to accountants because a lot of them yeah. have this image. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. think that's what it is. Whereas accountancy is is cool. It's great. It's fantastic. It's one of the most rewarding careers. Well, not that I can compare it to too many others, but you know what I mean? There is something mm. amazing about it. And 
I always thought instead of taking the fear out, can we put the fun in? Can you actually show mm. people that this is engaging with finance can be fun? Yeah. So let's make it over a bit. Let's make over the opinions, though, that people have of us because we're mm -hmm. changing and we have changed. Mm. But I'm not sure that we're bringing the rest of the world with us. Yeah. So, so yeah. So where are we perhaps not bringing, you know, the rest of the world with us in that one then, Susan? Where, where do you think we could do better? Well, I still feel when I meet and say, say oh, yeah, well, the accountants, they can't talk to anyone. And, you know, they're 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 boring or whatever it is. There, there is a very there's a stereotype that I feel we've mm. broken free from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that the rest of the world has come with us. So uh, that's yeah. what I'm trying to look at. How do we help the rest of the world see this is kind of cool? And I think, you know, look, if you work in a big organization, it's very, very different. You know, finance is at the table, I'm sure, in, you know, in Dell or Medtronics or, you know, I'm, you know, some of these bigger organizations, Kerry Group or whatever. Yes. But some of the smaller organizations, the backbone of the country, finance will still be have a back seat, I think. I, I see that. I see that as well, Susan. I, I just think probably it's, it's on finance, I guess, to move first. Right. And yes. uh, uh, one way I've, I've done, I found that successful is actually just bring around chocolates and bribes and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> to get people to have a talk with you yeah you know go get the coffees but but i suppose what are the more uh, serious <laughs> well it's all about bringing fun right so oh, so what, uh, any other any, any other sort of suggestions on how we can just move from that back seat again and that goes to most organizations uh that are that as you said are the backbone of most countries um how do how do we go from that back seat to more of the front one well i think well some of it is you know people are just people andrew and we all have something yeah. that someone else wants yes and it is about seeing, well, how do I connect with, you know, with Andrew? Well, we're both Irish. Let's start with there. Yeah. So yeah. I can go and talk to Andrew about whatever. Yeah. You know, how can you kind of, you know, research somebody, figure out some way of getting, you know, speaking with them in a way that they understand? Yeah. Yeah. And not and non-technical. <laughs> and non-technical. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, go for lunch with somebody. Lunch. Actually, that's a good one. I, I actually, think actually, that's, no, yeah, you yeah. know, especially when you're new somewhere in a different apartment, you know, don't stay in your own department. Walk yeah. around. What? I don't know. Uh, ask for directions. That's a good one. Yes. <laughs> you know, finance doesn't need to know everything. It's <laughs> often know? you to hear, oh, yeah, finance it over there in that corner. Yeah. yeah, yeah and, corner, you know, they never case, come out yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah, never, never. And and I think volunteer to do stuff, you yeah, know, to join definitely. a staff committee or whatever. Yeah, and even though, yeah, you're busy, so is everyone else. Yeah. yeah and yeah. building relationships makes life at work so much better. I love those suggestions. <laughs> Actually, just reminded me of one. There was uh, someone that said on the show, and I can't believe I missed this one. Food. Everyone everyone needs to eat oh, at yeah. some point. Yeah. So food's a good one to yeah. start with, I think. Uh, commonality. And also, you know, if we want to come to that stereotype, we're a bit tight with money. And some accountants are tighter than others. Coffee. You know, coffee yeah. doesn't cost a lot, no. you know, to, no. to pull someone outside the work environment. And, and, and again, that develops the, the relationship out, you know, on, on sort of work and outside of work a bit. And, yeah. and that's where you learn more it is. Um, about what's really going on with someone. And I think one thing I used to always do now, because I've worked all over the place, is on St. Patrick's Day, I would wear green. <laughs> <laughs> and I would bring green treats into the office. <laughs> yeah. That's a great one. And it's just again, and my people kind of see that, you know, that there's more to you than being an accountant. And that's what yeah. it's all about, because there is we want to be seen beyond the numbers. Yeah, I, I agree. I love that. I love I love how you came on to that, actually. That's, <laughs> it's a great it's a great catchphrase. Um, and I, I know I know that's your new um, it's your new business name, new mantra. Right. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, but 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 actually, uh, there was a point and I, I want to be respectful of time, but I do want to get to it is. The, the, the point you made about imposter syndrome is that perhaps maybe it's holding some of us back because because you were mentioning about your LinkedIn article and it was very well received and you got loads of messages over it. But um, maybe go through that for audience a bit, please, Susan. It was interesting. And at the time, you know, look, when was this? It was 2000 and say seven, eight time. And at that time, really, people didn't talk about anything still. I think, you know, the way we talk about feelings or introverts yes. or whatever it is now, it's way more open. But in, in the late 2000s, nothing like that. So I was promoted at 33 or I became a finance director at 33. And while I it was exciting and thrilling, it was also, I mean, I was 
frightened out of my life. And, um, you know, it was a huge responsibility. And I can remember sitting at my desk and sometimes thinking that when the other directors were in the chief executive's office, that they were talking about me oh. and that they any minute now that they would uncover that I really didn't know what I was doing. Oh my God. Yeah, like for no reason, really. Yeah, yeah, but just yeah. that feeling of, um, do I really know what I'm doing? Now, it would pass, and obviously that never happened. But there was one incident in particular where the bank wanted to do a, a review of our foreign exchange for us. And because we were working in countries all around the world, I mean, we had massive foreign exchange going on. But th that was something I was quite competent with and enjoyed as well. And so I had it set up, you know, quite well, as far as I was concerned. There's always room for improvement. But handing the files over to the bank, I kept thinking, like, they're going to find something now. You know, they're really going to uncover something that I've just made such a massive mistake. And I remember mm -hmm. handing the file to the relationship manager at the bank and, she, and said to her, when your team look at this, you're probably going to think I'm crap at my job. And it was a terrible way to feel yeah completely and of, yeah. of course like ridiculously you know three weeks later they come back and they said you know this has been through our forex team they cannot re recommend any changes or improvements oh, wow. yeah wow but it, it's not that i mean i'm a very confident person andrew i've great yeah. self-belief great determination and everything yeah, yeah. but this was just constantly kind of there in the background yeah, but I think I think it's there for a lot of people in our profession, though, Susan, that I fear of being caught world. out or wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They say like, you know, they say, but if research shows, I think 70 percent of people will feel this, will feel that they're not qualified enough to do the job, that they're going to get found out, that other people can do it better. Yeah. You know, and all of that kind of self-doubt, I suppose. Self-doubt, yeah. You know, and, and I think one of the things I, I say is my self-belief is greater than my self-doubt. It's tipping the balance just in that because because that will foster action. I mean, why do you do that? Why do you put it that way around? Because I feel it is like mm. I was never paralyzed with that fear. You know, I would always kind of talk myself out of it, realize it was a bit ridiculous. I know that some people don't take action. Like people will not apply for a job because they don't meet all the criteria. And that's just ridiculous. There isn't a person in the world that meets all the criteria. Yeah. I also suppose, you know, if you get good feed feedback, maybe is not the right word, appreciation or mm. constructive dialogue with somebody yeah. and build on that and, and keep note of your successes. Yeah. I think that's key. Keep a value log, keep a log of successes, yeah. a journal in that way. And very yeah. important. And, and you can reference that in the tough times, you know. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think... You know, and I still find, you know, sometimes I go, oh, my God, what am I doing? You know, coming on to this show, what, what's going to happen yeah, exactly, yeah. to me, you heck? know? Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, it's great. I, mean, I would really appreciate you sharing your story on that one. And, and, and I think I think that's an important point on appreciation is, as you said, most people have this way. So if you show a bit of appreciation to other people in that way, you're probably helping them build that self-belief over yes. the self-doubt where they'll take action and do something positive. Exactly. So, you know, like what a great gift to give people. And uh, no, I just really appreciate you sharing that advice, Susan. Yeah, um, and I, I do think like that, Andrew. I think everybody, we're all capable of so much. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, all you need, well, you need to believe in yourself, but you need others who'll believe in you as well. I, that's key. That's key. And again, I think that's where that point you made about appreciation is just, um, yeah. you know, that's a gift we can give to everyone. So easily. You know? And also a lot of people then don't like to take it. I know, yeah. And, and <laughs> this truly. is a very important because <laughs> what you say is yeah. it is a gift. It is and a what gift. do you do when you get a gift? You say thank you. Yeah, that's and right. that's all you have to say. Even if you don't, even if you're going, oh my God, they have no idea. Or, you know, it's just, I, I used to always say, oh, it's just me. Yeah. When somebody would yeah. thank me for something, you know, or appreciate something. Oh, it's just me. Yeah. Uh, but now yeah. I say yeah. thank you. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I actually let's start with the appreciation right away. So, so Susan, really appreciate all that great advice. It's been awesome. Thank you, and, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> and 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 I'd love to pick a you know some throw some rapid fire questions oh at you, God, particularly okay. maybe you know continue with that theme. Um, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? Well, this is from my dad, and it's I, like I, when I was a kid somewhere, and Dad said to me and my brother, I remember, um, like probably my sister as well, but. 
just because somebody is in a position of authority doesn't mean that they're right yeah. or that they know what they're doing. Yeah. And oh my God, I mean, I think, you know, it's got me into more trouble <laughs> <laughs> than anything else, but I've always been, I suppose, harder on people above me than people coming under me. Mm-hmm. And and being able to stand up for myself and for That's others key. because yes. of that. Yeah. Because yeah. I just think, you know, challenge someone. Yeah. And too yeah. much goes unsaid. And if you're not able to challenge them, and you don't have to do it in public, you can go to them afterwards. It's the right way. It's, yeah. Which is what I would normally do is go and have a chat with somebody and say, look, can we look at this another way or whatever. But yeah. So I think being able to challenge authority is a great thing. Obviously not the the guardy or the police or whatever but you know yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just thanks for qualifying that yeah there's a limit yeah that, that's the accountant and you're kicking in like yeah qualifying that statement yeah, yeah there are some yeah. groups you cannot <laughs> yeah. maybe and the auditors always auditors, the challenge, auditors. To challenge yeah, the yeah. auditors <laughs> although i do remember sitting in the boardroom once trying to get out the material materiality threshold off of them and they 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 did budget outside the meeting room but they weren't uh, there are times and places of challenging yeah. people as you i said. think that's yeah. it i think yeah and you know and you'll find you'll figure that out very quickly because yeah. you know you'll get into trouble <laughs> yeah it's a good correcting mechanism that, yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah. So I appreciate that advice, uh, Susan. That's great advice. Um, And I suppose in terms of resources, our audience could go check out maybe books or websites or anything. Would you recommend uh, on that front? Just in general, like stuff that's good to read or... Well, well, if there's a book, you've got a, a favorite book or um, right, a favorite place to go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, go ahead. I know, but I, I think TED Talks are great. TED Talks if, you know, great. if you want to like find stuff about anything, it's, it's a really good starting point. And, you know, they're 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. But I think probably one of the best, like a, a book, if you kind of want to understand a bit more about life and meaning and everything, is um, Viktor Frankl's Man's mm-hmm. Search for Meaning. And, you know, he talks about between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. Mm. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That's and very I, powerful. Isn't it? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's what it all comes down to is we, we choose. We choose how we react to things. We choose what we want to do. Sometimes we feel like we're not choosing, but we're always mm. choosing. Definitely. It's, it's amazing how many of us, maybe it's because we're caught up being busy or whatever, thinking we're, we're doing the right things. Like there's one thing I keep challenging in accounting is, is the month end or period end or the year end and the ridiculous hours some people are working. Mm. You know, you, you get really, um, how do you say, strange looks back when you say, well, you're choosing to work late. Yes. You know, and, you then, and then and then there's people that's come on this podcast that have shown us the way on how not to choose to work late, how to do things to limit you working late. And there was one person who's knocked 10 days off their, their wow. period end reporting. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know. Yeah. But uh, but I so, suppose if you're if you're on that treadmill it's trying to, yeah it's very hard it's very, very hard. hard and if very you don't have time to think andrew then yeah very hard and reflect so, i reflect. think like learning how to reflect yeah is very very powerful and questioning yeah. everything question everything yeah but um, it takes takes time it does. no it does <laughs> but you have to you have to kind of go do you know what i'm going to block out a day you have to yeah. Uh, or an hour. I, like I used well, to, I used to block small. out my diary. I would block out every lunchtime, mm. and I would block mm. out Monday mornings. Yeah. And oh. uh, obviously, stuff came in and happened that I had to kind of do or whatever. But it was there. Yeah. And I left yeah. my phone off when I went home. So there, there's some, some. So even if I wrote and said one or all of those things, you just created time. You created space, space, space. And I think well. Oh, space. It's also like, you know, there's another book, which I, I think is amazing if you're kind of on the, well, every, everybody, no one is an introvert or an extrovert, but there's a book called Quiet by Susan Cain. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, quiet in a world that cannot start speaking or something. And when I read that, it really opened my eyes to, to doing little things like that, that we're just talking like turning off your phone or getting space because... Mm. While I'm, I kind of sit, I'm an ambivert, I think they call them. Yeah. <laughs> if I can't recharge, mm-hmm. then forget it. 
Mm-hmm. Everything exactly. will go out the window, you know. And I, I'll. Yeah. It's just not. Let's not go there. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's for another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, well, look, look, Susan. Seriously, what, what great advice. If, if uh, some of our audience wish to continue the conversation, where's been the best place to connect with you at? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. And I'm getting more and more active on there. Also, I have a website, which is beyond hyphen the numbers dot com. Mm-hmm. And so you can send me an email as well at Susan at beyond hyphen the numbers dot com. Awesome. So I'll, I'll put those links into the show notes, Susan. Great. And, uh, and look, again, really appreciate the great advice. Um, but as we're sort of wrapping up, any sort of parting thoughts for our audience? Oh, I think make the most out of everything. Take on every opportunity you can and continue growing and learning and have fun. Have joy in your life. I like that. What a a great way to finish the show. So, Susan, really appreciate you coming on and investing time with us today. Thank you, Andrew. It was my pleasure. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. When all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers. 